Please take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, our text this morning extends from verse 46 to the end of the chapter, verse 52. In many ways, we've come to the end nearly of Jesus' story in the Gospel of Mark. When we begin chapter 11, we come to Holy Week. And like many of the Gospels, so it is in Mark, over a quarter of the book is taken up on one week in the life of Jesus. This text, which ends the previous section, really does serve as a summary of the whole. It points us to great truths about discipleship, but above all, it continues to point us to Jesus. But in order for us to have eyes that see him, that truly see him, we need the Holy Spirit's help. So let's ask him to come. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we do come asking that you would pour out your spirit upon us. In the spirit of the living God, we pray, fall fresh on us. Open our eyes of faith that we might see glorious riches in this portion of your gospel. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 46. And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling to you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So many of you know the tragic story of what happened to the musician Stephen Curtis Chapman and his wife Mary Beth back in 2009. For those of you who don't know or aren't aware, their son Will was backing out their Toyota Land Cruiser when their four-year-old daughter Maria ran out to meet him. The child was struck by the car and eventually died at Vanderbilt Hospital. In many ways it was worse than every parent's nightmare, worse because one child was harmed and it was as a result of an accident involving another. But as the Chapmans worked their way through that tragedy, were wrestling with their hearts, through the pain and the grief and the sorrow. One day, Stephen Curtis was walking through their house and came to the child's playroom. And there on the table where Maria would often do arts and crafts, he found a drawing that she had made on the day of the accident. On one side of the paper was a flower with six petals, only one of which was filled in. But then when he flipped the paper over, there was only a single word. It was the word C. And next to it was drawn a butterfly. And Stephen Curtis later wrote, I felt like it was a tangible reminder to my family and to me 
to continue to look at this life with an eternal perspective, to taste and to see that the Lord is good. Even when this earthly life seems so hard and so sad at the moment, that's the struggle, isn't it? That's the struggle. It's the struggle to see. To see life with an eternal perspective. To see that the Lord is in fact good. To see that Jesus really is better than that everything that I cling to, that I keep thinking is actually going to satisfy my heart. The struggle is to see. I mean, we get blinded. We get blinded by our desires and our distractions. We get blinded by our heartaches and our heartburns. We think we have to manage its life, both its successes and its failures. And then when we find we can't manage it, we can't handle it. When the sea billows roll over us and we feel as though we're drowning, that's when we know we can't handle it and we get crushed by the weight of this sad, sad world, as John Calvin said. Friends, at the heart, at the very heart of following Jesus is this struggle to see. And that's because we're blind. We're blinded, but at the end of the day, we, we still have blind spots. We're spiritually blind. If there's been anything that you should have seen as we've been working our way through the last couple of chapters of the Gospel of Mark, it's been this issue of the spiritual blindness of the disciples. Over and over and over again, Jesus has told them the truth about who he is, about what he's come to do. Over and over again, the disciples haven't gotten it. The disciples haven't wanted to see Jesus as he actually is. They wanted to cling to their, their imagination of, of, of what life was going to be like, of what Jesus was like. As Jesus is on the road telling them that he is on his way to Jerusalem, he's going to be delivered over. He's going to suffer. He's going to be betrayed. He's going to be mocked upon, spit upon. He's going to be killed. On the third day, he's going to rise. The disciples didn't want to see that. Instead, they spend their time arguing over who's going to be the greatest. And so the question that should have been occurring to you all along the way as we've been working through these chapters from Mark chapter 8 all the way to this point is how are the disciples going to be delivered from their blindness? How are they actually going to see Jesus as he actually is? Well, Jesus already told us. In chapter 10, verse 27, with man this is impossible, but not with God. With God, all things are possible. Only God, in the person of Jesus Christ, can deliver the disciples from their blindness. Guess what? Only God, through Jesus Christ, can actually deliver you from your blindness so that you can see. See Jesus as he actually is. That, that's what this story is doing here. This account of, of Bartimaeus, it shows us that Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, is not only willing, but he is able to rescue us, to heal us, to save us from ourselves and the blindness that we all too willingly embrace. You and I are just like Bartimaeus. Where does Jesus find him? Well, Jesus finds him blind on the side of the road. Jesus and his disciples are making their way to Jerusalem. They've come to the new city of Jericho, this city that was built by Herod the Great, one of the oldest continuous occupied cities in, in world history. But this new city built by Herod the Great, was meant to display his greatness. And it was amazing. Jesus spends the night there, leaves, makes his way towards the old city on the 18-mile journey up to Jerusalem, where he'll gain about 3,500 feet of elevation. And as he's leaving the old city, what does he find? As he leaves the old city with his disciples, with the great crowd, who does he see? Well, he sees... Bartimaeus. That's what verse 46 tells you. As he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. 
Two things striking there. One is that you know his name. This is the only person in the entire Gospel of Mark whom Jesus heals who's actually named. And he's not only named, he's named twice. Bartimaeus, oh, by the way, the son of Timaeus. Here at the end, at this final healing, Mark wants you to, to know that this man is a real man with a real name. Mark knows his name. Jesus knows his name. Jesus knows your name. Knows your blindness. The other thing that's striking is where he's sitting. He's sitting by the side of the road. It's what it tells you. Of course, that makes sense, right? We know the corners in our city of Memphis where panhandlers sit in order to gather alms. So it is in the ancient world. Here on this road that leads up to Jerusalem, a road that many would travel as they go on pilgrimage near the Passover as this scene is, Bartimaeus has positioned himself in order to collect their alms. But he's not just a beggar. No, the text tells you he's a blind beggar. Now you got to notice this. I mentioned it in my pastor's letter this week. Think back to Mark chapter 8. Right before Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah, what happens? Do you remember? Mark chapter 8 verse 22. Remember Jesus heals a blind man. And, and it's that weird two-stage healing where after the first time Jesus a, a, applies the salve to his eyes and he says, what do you see? And the blind man sees, says, I see men like trees walking. And then Jesus follows through and heals him completely. And remember, I said that was to show the condition of the disciples. They're going to confess Jesus is the Messiah, but they don't see him clearly and what have we seen since that point? Exactly that. Three times Jesus has told the disciples about his mission and mandate. Three times the disciples clearly don't get it, are clearly blind to what Jesus is saying. And how does the whole section end? Another blind man. In other words, Mark has done a great big sandwich between Mark chapter 8, verse 22, and here Mark chapter 10, verse 46, showing you that everything that goes in between it is characterized by the lack of spiritual sight. And it's on display here in Bartimaeus, who is clearly lacking his physical eyesight. He's blind. And yet though he lacks eyesight, he doesn't lack for insight. Why do I say that? Well, because, because as Jesus is passing by, he's told it's Jesus of Nazareth, verse 47. And so he begins to cry out to him. But in crying out to him, what does he say? Does he say, Jesus of Nazareth, have mercy on me? No, what does he say? Look at it, verse 47. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Why does he say that? Well, son of David is a messianic title. It reaches back to one of the most important promises of the Old Testament. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 11 to 13, where David has been promised that from his family tree would come a forever king ruling over a forever kingdom. Of course, David dies. And in fact, by the time you get to Ezekiel, it seems as though the Davidic line has come to an end. God's people are in exile. But what does Ezekiel 34 promise you? Well, in line with all the prophets, Ezekiel promises you that God himself will come to shepherd his people. God himself will rule over them. And how is he going to do it? Through his prince, David. And so from 2 Samuel 7 through the prophets down to this day, the title Son of David had messianic meaning. And so here, this blind man is crying out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me, not because he's doing Jesus' genealogy. No, he, he's crying out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy upon me, because he's saying, Jesus, you're the Messiah. You're the promised forever king ruling over your forever kingdom. You have power and authority. And so please, Jesus, have mercy on me. 
My friends, here is a level of insight that far surpasses anything you would find in the crowd. A level of insight that's beyond that of the Pharisees. Even the disciples, though they confess Jesus is Messiah, they're still clinging to this, this life they've imagined for themselves and what that means that Jesus is the Messiah. But not Bartimaeus. Though he's blind, he sees Jesus clearly. The crowd doesn't see him, though. Doesn't see Jesus, doesn't see what Bartimaeus is saying. How do we know? They rebuke him. That's what the text says in verse 48. Many rebuke him, just like, just like Jesus' disciples had done with the children. Remember the parents who were bringing the children so that Jesus might bless them? And they rebuked him, so the crowd with Bartimaeus rebuked him. Does that stop him? No. No, defiantly, desperately, insistently, incessantly, Bartimaeus cries out, Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. Until Jesus stops in the middle of the road. That's what it says. Verse 49, Jesus stopped. Literally, he came to a standstill. As he has this huge crowd behind him, on their way to Jerusalem, on pilgrimage at Passover, it all comes to a, a grinding halt. What mercy this is. Jesus casting a look on him, stopping at the voice, at the faith-filled voice of this blind man, stops right in the middle of the road. He says, call him. When Bartimaeus hears that he's being called, he scrambles up, he casts the cloak aside, that cloak was likely stretched across his lap. It was the way that the alms would be collected. They would have been thrown into his lap. He cast aside the cloak. He cast aside the money. Something better is calling him. He scrambles up. He's led to Jesus. And Jesus asks him the question. Not a question. No, it's the question. Verse 51. What do you want me to do for you? Now, put your finger there on verse 51. What do you want me to do for you? Look back to chapter 10, verse 36. You see it? Mark 10, verse 36. James and John have just asked him for positions of power. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? It's the same question. It's the same question in, in your English versions. It's the same question in the Greek. It's the same question that Jesus is asking you. When Jesus asked his disciples, what did they say? Jesus, we want to sit on your right hand and on your left hand. Jesus, we want positions of prominence. Jesus, we want positions of privilege. Jesus, we want positions of power. We want to be exalted. We want to have power over others. We want to be first among the disciples. Jesus, we want the life we imagine. Jesus, we want a suffering-free, pain-free life. Jesus, give us what we want. That's how they answered. But Jesus asks you the same question. It's the question. What do you want me to do for you? He's asking you. I'm not asking you. Right now, in this moment, Jesus is asking you, what do you want me to do for you? How do you respond? What's your request? Notice Bartimaeus's. And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. I love how Mark emphasizes again that he's blind. It speaks to his deep need. But that word for rabbi, it's not the common word for rabbi. In fact, this word for rabbi is only used in one other place in all of the New Testament. Do you know where? John chapter 20, verse 16. There, after Mary sees that this man in the garden by the tomb is not the gardener, but is in fact Jesus, she uses this Greek word and says, Rabboni. It was a word that Jews only used in reference to deity. 
my God, my master, my teacher. And she fell at his feet. That's the word. So that when Bartimaeus cries out, Rabboni, what is he saying? Oh, master, oh, my God, oh, my teacher, I want to see. I want to see. I want, I want this blindness to be done with. I want this blindness to be gone away. I want to be able to see, and I want the very first see, my master, to be yours. I want your face to be the one I see. Oh, Lord, I want to see. Jesus is asking you, what do you want me to do for you? As he asks me that, that's what I, I want to see. I want to see Jesus. I want to see that this world with its pleasures and its baubles and its trinkets and all the pleasures that it offers is nothing compared to Jesus. That this everything, this everything that I cling to, my possessions, my home, my kids, my wife, my position, all that I have, my fingers are going to be taken away from that. Yours are too in your dying day. None of us take what we've got with us, my friends. There's everything we cling to. It's nothing compared to Jesus. I, I want to see, to really see that all of the jealousies I harbor and all of the experience I long for, they're simply the wind, they're, they're vapor. It's like trying to grab smoke. I want to see. I want to really see Jesus in all of his excellency and all of his beauty and all of his glory. That his way is the best way because he's on that way. Even if that best way leads to pain and suffering and sorrow and tragedy, I'd rather be with Jesus than have luxury and pleasure galore in this life. I want to see Jesus. Do you? As Jesus asks you, what do you want me to do for you? Does your heart cry out with Bartimaeus with me? I want to see. Listen, when we ask this of Jesus, when we come to Jesus as our master and our God and our great teacher, and we say, Jesus, I want to see, you know what he says? Go your way. Your faith has made you well, or literally your faith has saved you. Not because his faith is great, but because the object of his faith is so great and so good and so excellent and so beautiful and so glorious. All we have to do is to say to Jesus, I want to see. Oh, have mercy on me. And Jesus always answers that prayer and says, I will have mercy. So that we can sing as, as the hymn writer does, Lord, I was blind. I could not see in thy marred visage any grace, but now... The beauty of thy face in radiant vision dawns on me. When Jesus says, go your way, and immediately he recovers his sight, what's the first face he sees? He's not looking around to his wife. He's not looking around to his kids. He's not looking after the money that had been thrown in his cloak that he cast aside. What's the first face he looks for? Jesus is. And that, that guides his response. Because having seen the face of Jesus, having seen him in his glory and his beauty and his excellency is the only one who can satisfy his heart, he goes from being blind on the side of the road to believing in the middle of the road to following along the road. That's what happens. Verse 52, and immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. That's his response. He was sitting on the side of the road. But now, now he follows Jesus. Where is he following Jesus? Where is he going? To Jerusalem. And what's going to happen there? Everything Jesus has said. Jesus is going to be delivered over. He's going to be betrayed. He's going to be condemned by the Jewish authorities, condemned by the Roman authorities. He's going to be mocked. He's going to be spit upon. He's going to be flogged. He's going to be killed. And on the third day, he's going to rise again. And those who follow him can expect the same treatment. So when Bartimaeus sees the face of Jesus with all of his glory and beauty and excellency and says, I'm going to follow you on the way, he's following him to his own death. Just as Jesus said, if anyone comes after me, 
Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. But it was worth it. Why? Because, because of who Jesus is. Because of what he's come to do. Because that cross is actually the means by which you and I are delivered from the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. It's because that cross is the place where the wrath of curse of, and curse of God is poured out. Where our sorrows and griefs are poured out. And Jesus endures it all. And it's at that cross that salvation is won. So that blind people can see. And grace might be poured out from that cross for 2,000 years to this very day and this very moment. So that when you say to Jesus, I want to see, he says, my child, see, because my blood has won that for you. That's why it makes sense. So what's your response? Will you follow Jesus along the road, having seen him to be beautiful and excellent and glorious as the only one who can satisfy are you still clinging to your everything? Friends, we heard a couple weeks ago, we were all moved. I heard it all through the congregation. A couple weeks ago, one of our teenagers, Chris Lee Vaughn, stood up here and said, you can have the whole world. Just give me Jesus. And we said, oh, isn't that beautiful? Do you believe it? Do you really believe that? That you can have the whole world. If I can just have Jesus... That's enough. We talk a lot about discipleship in our town. Discipleship this, discipleship that, who are you discipling? This is discipleship. It's following after Jesus, even if it leads to your own dying, even if it leads to sorrow and suffering and difficulty and pain, because Jesus is worth it. And having embraced the cross, there's a crown on the other side. That's what he's promised. And we believe and cling to the promise. And so Jesus is asking you the question, what do you want me to do for you? And he's saying, come. Come, you sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore, come. Will you come? Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we do come. And we beg that you would give us eyes to see and hearts to believe the good news of the gospel. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.